Hi there, I'm Jack Kelly with the UW-Madison Center for Journalism Ethics. Thanks for checking out our public safety reporting toolkit for local journalists. Today in our expert Q&A, I talk with Professor Richard Rosenfeld of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Professor Rosenfeld shares some great insight and some important insight with me about the spike in violent crime, especially gun violence that we saw in 2020. He provides some useful insight for what journalists should be focusing on as they cover crime in their own communities. Here's my conversation with Professor Rosenfeld. Hope you enjoy. You know, in 2020 na nationwide, we saw a big spike in gun violence. Right. What in your mind were some of the big contributing factors to that spike in violence? One has to speculate. Uh, there's nothing really uh, definitive out there yet about the sources of the increase in homicide and, and, and non-fatal gun violence. Um, but so I can distill the, what I re regard as some of the more informed speculation. Um, and let's divide the explanations into uh, three more or less interrelated parts. First of all, there's the pandemic. And, um, you know, I, I suppose the um, most common or conventional lay explanation is the pandemic imposed a great deal of stress and strain on individuals and households and they acted out in violence. Um, that tends not to be the explanation that's being pursued uh, at least vigorously by researchers. Although researchers don't deny the importance of the stresses and strains associated with the pandemic, and in particular with respect to domestic violence, where in my view, that argument probably applies best. Um, and that brings us to the impact of the pandemic on policing. Officers, lots of officers were out on quarantine. And of those who remained on the job, they were subject to social distancing requirements by their agencies or their own discretion to maintain distance between themselves and people they might have encountered on the street. And that reduces the kind of so-called smart, proactive policing that can help to keep crime, including violent crime, in check. So uh, I wouldn't discount the impact of the pandemic on what in my business is generally called de-policing, right? Reduce police activity. And then uh, if you look closely at when uh, homicide and gun crimes were going up, they didn't begin to go up at the beginning of the pandemic or the, or the um, imposition of pandemic related restrictions back in mid-March last year. They went up almost immediately after George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis on May 25th. So certainly there is a coincidence in time between the uptick in homicide and other violence and uh, the killing of George Floyd and the immediate emergence of widespread uh, po protest against police violence. The two coincide in time, that doesn't mean that there's a, uh, an easy to explain causal connection. Nonetheless, let's assume there is some causal connection. Uh, what might it consist of? And here we have, uh, again, a de-policing argument made. Now, the people who make this argument are, are less likely to invoke the pandemic, more likely to talk about, well, you know, in the midst of widespread anger and protest against police violence, Lots of cops are just demoralized. Uh, you know, they're angry, they're frustrated. They don't think they're, uh, that policymakers are on their side, what have you. And they begin to draw back from full engagement in their duties and that can lead to a homicide increase, an increase in other violence. Um, now, in particular instances, there's something to that argument, I think. Um, but that's, you know, kind of that's the nature of the argument. It's tied very much to anecdotes about particular instances. Whether there's a kind of citywide, you know, nationwide uh, connection between police 
withdrawal or depolicing and homicide remains a very open question. I want, to, I want to ask you about too, you know, the last year has been extraordinary for many reasons, uh, the pandemic, nationwide protests. There are also other you know, social causes, systemic causes of gun violence. Which, yeah, yeah, could you yeah. walk us through a couple of the, the key ones that you found in your research? And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, what, what, what should local journalists know about these trends beyond just yeah. the data? when they're trying to report on stories. Got it, okay. Um, well, uh, I think it's important to make the following distinction. What we've been talking about is a big and very abrupt rise in crime, specifically homicide and, and gun violence. Um, so there, that's, that calls attention to one category of explanations and I, talked about some of those. But you're right to note, I didn't point to fundamental or so-called root causes because the root causes didn't, you know, root causes are, are just that, they're deeply embedded. They don't change abruptly or quickly. They certainly are responsible for the elevated rates of violence that we see in communities that are characterized by high levels of poverty, high levels of racial segregation, um, a history of um, uh, negative relations with the police. Um, you know, those are root causes. And so I guess the police relationship would be, would fall into both categories. Uh, so I don't want to diminish the significance of the so-called root causes. Uh, because they are tied in some way to these more immediate causes. Uh, I'll give you an example. It's not as if homicide went up everywhere in every population group in every community. I'm guessing in your community, or if you know a bit about Milwaukee, homicide didn't go up in all neighborhoods in Milwaukee. It tended to rise in neighborhoods where homicide rates were already pretty high, right? And those tend to be in most big cities uh, disadvantage, economically disadvantage, uh, racially isolated communities of color, right? Uh, and so the two types of explanation are tied together in that sense. But it's important, I think, nonetheless, to distinguish them. So if you want to explain why certain neighborhoods in Milwaukee always seem to have much higher homicide rates than other neighborhoods, then the culprits are uh, chronic joblessness, uh, low wages, high levels of poverty, high levels of family disruption. I mean, it's no surprise. If you want to explain why homicide went up as much as it did and as rapidly and abruptly as it did last, you know, late last May and early June, well, a different set of explanations comes in, right? That's what I would try to communicate to journalists. Distinguish between these precipitating causes of a big change in crime from chronic causes of different levels of crime across different types of communities. Now, I, before, before you ask me, how should journalists be covering crime differently? Right? I wouldn't say... Um, yeah, you know, I think you mentioned, well, uh, you know, maybe um, um, portray crime in more, uh, with greater empathy, that sort of thing. I think journalists are doing a decent enough job. The typical crime story begins with an incident or two, right? Look at the coverage of um, the killing of a 13 year old in Chicago. Uh, the, the, I mean, the police killing of, um, uh, that occurred in uh, Brooklyn, Brookline Center, uh, you know, uh, not to mention the George Floyd killing. I think those, the, the coverage of those police killings has been uh, quite empathetic, you know, reasonably well-rounded. So I don't, my own view is, I don't think that that's where journalists fall down. 
I think where journalists tend to fall down is the absence of context for those, you know, in most cases, just entirely gruesome, heart-rending stories. Um, so what do I mean by context? Uh, think of how um, the Milwaukee Journal covers business. It has a business page. Uh, indeed, it probably has a business section. Um, so, and what, what do you read about in the business section? You read about the ups and downs of individual companies, right? Oh, this company is way up, its stock is selling well. Um, uh, you read about um, um, uh, uh, businesses whose uh, executives have engaged in or been accused of fraud or other misdoing. You know, there's a lot of, uh, of I don't know if you would call it empathy in those stories, but there's a whole lot of particular detail. But what you also get on the business page is the broader context. So you might hear about a company whose stock just plummeted, but right next to that story, there's a reading of the stock market. The stock market itself may or may not have gone down. The it is easy to put the particular instant, instant in a broader context. So you'll have stories about the particulars, and then you'll also have stories about um, you know, the 30,000 foot vision. What's happening to the unemployment rate? What's happening to the inflation rate? What's happening to wages and so forth? stock market. That's what we lack, I think, most of all with respect to the coverage of crime. Most papers do not have a public safety page or section that runs with any regularity. Now, some papers, and I think more than in the past, are doing a decent job of trying to sneak some contacts in where their editors will permit the extra space, you know, um, but that's not, uh, you know, that's, I think that's unusual. And uh, in my conversations with reporters, they would love, uh, certainly crime reporters would love to have more space to stretch out. Um, but it's just not a, a journalistic priority in the print media and then uh, and online media. And forget about television, you know. <laughs> So that's where I am on journalistic coverage of crime. I'd like to see it more like the coverage of business. Sure. sure. Well, Professor Richard Rosenfeld of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Professor, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me. I appreciate it. You're welcome.